So the question is, really, does it even make sense to forgive your enemies? And I know the Bible says we're supposed to. We all kind of get that impression. Regardless of whether or not you're a Christian, you kind of know that's part of the deal with Jesus, is that you forgive your enemies. But what does that really look like? And what does it mean? And is it even good common sense to forgive an enemy? This is one of the most common questions I've heard through this whole series called Weightless, is if I forgive my enemy, won't they just do it again? Am I not just giving them permission to hurt me again the same way they've hurt me before? Isn't it just enabling bad behavior? Am I not just being a doormat if I forgive my enemies? I can forgive my friends. I can forgive a spouse. I can forgive some of my family. <laughs> but forgiving enemies, man, that just doesn't even make sense on some level, especially if your enemies are still at it. Right? So especially if they're continuing to hurt you in some way, or if they're not sorry about it, and they'll never say they're sorry for it. You know they'll never be remorseful. You know they'll never repent and turn it around. What does it even mean to forgive someone like that? Well, in those situations, what I want us to understand is that really not all forgiveness is created equal. Not all forgiveness is created equal. There's different kinds of forgiveness, different levels of forgiveness. There's different paths to forgiveness. There's different outcomes you should expect. The outcome you should expect if you're, if you're forgiving your spouse, you should expect probably reconciliation. You should expect a stronger bond on the other side of that. If you're forgiving a family member or a close friend, you should expect kumbaya, you know, let's hug it out. But if you're forgiving your enemy, I think it's okay to expect different outcomes. Sometimes forgiving an enemy doesn't mean hugging it out. Sometimes forgiving an enemy might just mean letting them go. Sometimes forgiving an enemy might just mean you never have to think about them again. Can I get an amen from the congregation? <laughs> right? So I think it's, it's okay. I want to release you and give you permission to think about forgiveness in that way. There is a difference. I, I came out, out with three distinctions between forgiving enemies and forgiving people close to us, people that we really care and care about and love, right? So the first distinction that I think really matters is that whenever you learn to forgive an enemy, your, your spirit grows, your character is shaped. Jesus grows you up, in other words, in ways that aren't necessarily the same when you forgive someone close to you. When you forgive an enemy, you grow up in faith. You grow up in character. It can be a major turning point in your life of faith when you learn to forgive an enemy. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was the common sense narrative of his day. That's the common sense narrative of our day. That's what you've heard, that's what we do. You love your neighbor, you love your friends, your family, but you hate your enemy. That's obvious. But I tell you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, in other words, if you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that, and those were the worst of the worst, right? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, there's times when I really love the things Jesus has to say, and then there's times like this. <laughs> then there's Matthew 5, uh, where he tells us to be perfect as our Father in heaven. I... I thought this whole Christianity business was about you don't have to be perfect. Haven't you heard that? You've heard me say that. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to live a perfect life. It's not about your behavior. You know, it's about your heart and that kind of stuff. And here's Jesus saying, be perfect as your father. What is happening here? I think it's important to read the whole passage and take it as a whole. Because Jesus isn't talking about just morality. He's not talking about just behavior. He's talking about love. That's where he starts. Love your enemy. 
And then at the end he says, be perfect, therefore as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's, he's not talking about behaving the right way all the time. He's talking about learning and growing to love the way God loves. And so what I want to say today is that forgiving your enemies sometimes means allowing the Spirit of God to perform over, the, uh, over time, to perform in you a heart transplant so that you learn to love differently. And we all need to learn to love differently. Human love, the love most of us are accustomed to giving and receiving, it's petty at its core. It's not enough. It only goes so far. There is another kind of love and another way of loving. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this book called Life Together, and he knew a little bit about loving his enemies. If you know anything about his story, he spent the last part of his life in a concentration camp because he tried to assassinate Hitler, which is freaking awesome. But he did that, and then he died in a concentration camp. But, but while, while he was was there, he wrote all these things about loving each other and loving our enemies. And, and this, is, this is what Bonhoeffer said in his book, Life Together. He said, human love cannot love an enemy. Cannot love an enemy. That is one who stubbornly resists it, resists that effort to love. Human love is by its very nature desire, desire for human community. So long as it can satisfy this desire in some way, it will not give it up. But where it can no longer expect its desire to be fulfilled, there it stops short, namely in the face of an enemy. There it turns to hatred and contempt. Human love makes an end in itself, an idol to be worshipped. It loves itself and nothing else in the world. Have you ever experienced this kind of love, you, love addicts? Like, uh, th this, is, this is so common these days, just the idea of loving love, right? Um, you, you don't love him, you just love the idea of him, that kind of thing, that, you know what I'm saying? Okay, you're with me. Um, spiritual love, however, comes from Jesus. As only Christ can speak to me in such a way that I may be saved, so others too can be saved only by Christ himself. It's not your job to save them. It's Jesus' job to save them, to work on them. Leave it to him. In other words, this means that I then must release the other person from every attempt of mine to regulate, coerce, or dominate him with my love. I must meet him only as the person he already is in Christ's eyes. This is a distinction between forgiving someone who's close to you and forgiving an enemy. It's allowing the Spirit of God to perform a heart transplant to show you how to love the way God loves. The second distinction that I think is important is that whenever you forgive an enemy, you yourself own up to your own mistakes. It's an act in humility. It's realizing that you once were an enemy of God too. And that God, instead of choosing to punish or lash out or cut you off, God chose to be reconciled to you. God chose to forgive you. You ever notice in the Lord's Prayer that we pray most weeks before communion that Jesus says in his prayer, his model prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors? Or we Methodists say, forgive us our trespasses for some reason, as we forgive those who trespass against us? You ever heard a singer try to fit all those words into where <laughs> debtors should be? It's pretty awesome. It's, it's a magical feat to do that. Uh, it'd be much easier if we went back to debts and debtors, but I'm going to leave that there. It's been too many years now. It's too far gone. <laughs> But why does he say it in the first place? Why doesn't Jesus just say, forgive us our debts? Just forgive us, and we're good. Why does he connect to it this other qualifier? As we forgive our debtors. This is a, a real hang-up for a lot of people. I keep hearing from people saying, because here and in other parts of the New Testament, there seems to be a connection or a correlation between the way we forgive others and the way God forgives us. It's almost like it can be read as though our limitations in terms of our forgiveness of other people limits God's forgiveness of us. And so, again, I thought this Christianity thing was supposed to be about the free gift. What happened to the free gift of God's grace that covers all of our sins? I thought you didn't have to do anything to earn that stuff. And here it looks like you do. What's happening here? And I understand that reading of it. I do understand that, that concern. But I think, we're, I think we're flipping the script a little bit. Because I don't believe, it doesn't fit into the, the whole Christian narrative to say, to say that God withholds his forgiveness from you. That God doesn't, he only forgives you a little bit until you learn to forgive a lot. 
That's not the way it works. Instead, what it looks like is more like this. If you only forgive a little bit, then you've only allowed yourself to be forgiven, really, a little bit. So the measure to which you're able to absorb and receive the full forgiveness of God and the freedom that comes with it, that is reflected in the way you choose and are able to forgive others. So it's not God that's limited, it's you that's limited. When you only, in a limited way, receive God's forgiveness in kind of a nominal way, you say, yeah, I'm forgiven and I'm free, but gosh, I hate so many people. You know, then (laughs) you're really not free. You really haven't absorbed the forgiveness of God. And so you're gonna see that correlation playing itself out again and again. And and so um, that's, I think that's how it works. Receiving forgiveness um, allows you to extend it. And receiving forgiveness means owning your mistakes, realizing you've messed up too. You've been a broken person too. You've behaved as an enemy of God too. The third and and final way before I get to a story I want to tell you today, the third and final way that I think forgiveness of enemies is distinct from other kinds of forgiveness is that when you forgive an enemy, you're standing up to evil. You're standing up against evil. I'm just going to let this passage speak for itself because it's so awesome. This is Romans 12, 17 to 21. If you've ever felt like Christianity is just a doormat philosophy, you need to hear this, what Paul says about forgiving enemies. 12, uh, 12 chapter of Romans 17 to 21. Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath as it is written. It is mine to avenge, I'll repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, Paul says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. This is, the, this is the fuzzy and warm part of it. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head. <laughs> Can I get an amen from the congregation? <laughs> Ever felt like heaping burning coals on your enemy's head? Paul says, do it. But do it with kindness and love in your hearts, right? So... <laughs> The, the heaping of bur- burning coals on, on the, the head was, we think it was historically um, in several cultures actually like a, a shaming, a public way of shaming sin, shaming evil, unrepentant darkness in your midst. Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Listen to me when I tell you, forgiving your enemy does not mean Bending the knee to him or her. Forgiving your enemy does not mean being a doormat to him or her. Forgiving your enemy does not mean enabling that behavior or saying it's okay or acting like it's fine or like it never even happened. That is not what the Bible talks about. It's not what I'm talking about when we say forgiving your enemies. Forgiving your enemies is not about defeat. It is about victory. It is not about submission to evil. It is about victory over evil, overcoming it with good. If you, if you really want to hold your enemy accountable, someone who's harmed you, you really want to harm them, uh, hold them accountable, the way to do that is not by fighting their darkness with more darkness of your own. You don't fight fire with fire, you fight it with water. And for us, the water represents the, the baptism, right? That's why we baptize people to wash away sin and, and to show our forgiveness, our, our forgiveness, God's forgiveness of us. That's why we baptize. And, and so we, we don't come at darkness and evil with more darkness and evil. We don't come at violence with violence. We come at it with light and goodness, forgiveness and joy. That's victory, not defeat. All right, um, so before... I started writing this message. I I struggled with it some, more than most, because, just for this reason, I couldn't think of an enemy. I'm just that nice. (laughs) No, when you're a pastor, you have to pretend like you like everybody. That's why. So I couldn't think of an enemy. It's real talk right there, man. I, I just... I couldn't put a face on him. I'm like, I'm not a superhero. I don't like have an arch enemy or, I'm, you know, I'm not a warrior. I'm just, I'm just a guy. And there's Satan, I guess, but I just can't bring myself to forgive Satan. I don't know where to start with that. And so anything short of Satan, I just couldn't put a face on my enemies. I don't know if you can. If you can, I hope you, you have that person in mind throughout the rest of this sermon. Just keep them close. Think on them. For me, it didn't really happen until I went to Louisiana, of all places, with the 
the production team of the Maybe God podcast. We went there to record an interview for episode one of season two. That's coming to an iPhone near you, by the way. So, um, I went there to interview a professor of mine from college. His name is Dr. Otto. If I have an enemy, it's Dr. Otto. It's a pretty good name for an enemy, if I might say so myself. If I have an enemy, it's him. I have harbored so much anger and resentment toward him because uh, he broke me. And it's so clear to me that he broke me and I've heard from others that he's broken to over the years. And uh, he did it intentionally. He's not sorry for it, he's proud of it. He wears it as a badge of honor around the campus. And he talks about breaking certain students, students that come from Bible Belt homes, you know, Christian students. And I can't even count all the times that he zeroed in on, on me as a Christian or on some other Christians in class to make us feel small and stupid, frankly, for believing the stuff that Christians believe. And so this is what he would do. He would, he would propose these preposterous theories that I didn't know at the time. I've known since, but I didn't know at the time. I was 19 years old. I didn't know then. He would propose these preposterous theories about Jesus and Christianity to discredit the Bible, to discredit the faith of Christians. And those theories had been debunked. I didn't know it then. They'd been vetted and debunked by honest academics, but he proposed them as though they were the truth. He proposed them in a very objective way, even though they were extremely subjective in their nature. So he would propose theories like Jesus never really existed. Jesus wasn't a figure in history. Jesus was this mythological made-up guy along the lines of, you know, the ancient Greek gods or, or you know, Mithras of uh, the Persian Empire or whatever other popular gods and mythological figures there were at the time. And these theories had all been debunked, but it didn't stop him from presenting them as though they were absolute truth. He went so far as to say that if Jesus did actually exist, and this is true, you're going to be surprised if he actually existed, then he carried on, probably carried on multiple affairs with his disciples, both men and women. At one point, he even instructed us in a class to pair up in pairs of two, boy, girl, and one pair at a time, he instructed us to stand up in front of the class, 19 years old, stand up in front of the class, a boy and a girl, and read together the narrative, uh, the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well from John chapter 4. Which doesn't sound strange at all for a New Testament class like the one we were in, except for the fact that he instructed us to read that narrative in what he called erotic voice, as if Jesus was picking up this woman as if it was this pre-intimate encounter. And if you go back and read John 4, like, it messed with me forever. Like, now I have to really try hard not to read it in erotic voice anymore. Like, now it's messed with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it did something to me. Something broke in me. And I know how stupid it sounds now, y'all. I'm embarrassed to say this. But listen, I was 19 years old. I was impressionable. I didn't know how to think critically yet. I didn't know how to, how to think through these things. And so I, I bought it, all of it, hook, line, and sinker. I bought it. I thought he was the smartest man I'd ever met. And I was a rebellious young kid. I wanted to rebel against all that stuff that I was raised with. And so he gave me license and some ammunition to do that. And I, I can't really explain it now. I, I wasn't smart enough to go to the original source material. Had I been that smart, I would have found out for myself what a fraud he was at the time. But for whatever reason, I, I bought it. I took 10 classes from him. I was his office assistant for a year. I graduated believing Jesus was a fraud. At best, he was a myth along the lines of Zeus or Apollo. What followed after that were 12 very confusing years, as you might imagine, where, and I didn't know what else to do with my life. All my, my father, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather were pastors, and so I, I didn't know how else to make a living outside of church. And so I kept working around and in churches, but I refused to call myself a Christian. I hated the word. I despised the word evangelical. I thought, I thought evangelical Christians were everything that was wrong with the world, 
right? And so I actually became anti-Christian during that season of my life. There's no denying it. Like I spent most of my time arguing with Christians and belittling them, mostly online. It started with MySpace, and then there was Facebook, and then there was Reddit, and there was every online news article ever written about anything related to Christianity. I would pick a fight, and I would just, I would be that, play that role. I would be doc, Dr. Otto to them. And I alienated a lot of people. I lost a lot of friends. Made a lot of people feel as small as he had made me feel at times. But I still continued to live and work around churches. I still liked the philosophies of Jesus, you know? I liked his social justice bent. I liked the idea that we're here to make a difference and we're here to serve the poor and feed the hungry and, and help the prisoner. We're, we're here to take care of people. So I did those things during that 12-year span. I helped immigrants find jobs. I helped refugees find homes. I helped build shelters for homeless people. I, I, I helped urban kids find their way to college. I was doing all those things, but underneath all of that, there was this other thing happening within me that only those closest to me could see. I was tail spinning into this, into this deep despair and depression. I would hit these walls of burnout. Why was I just so deep in that darkness of, of burnout and depression? Because that's what happens when you have the highest ideals in life and no truth or foundation on which to stand. That's what happens when you want the world to change, but there's no reason it should ever really change. That's what happens when you say, things should be this way, but you have no objective truth that gives you permission to use the word should, ever. And when you sit with that reality and you work your tail off to help people and nothing ever changes and you have no reason to believe anything will ever change because there's no divine authority, no objective truth to bring about any change in this life or through eternity, then who cares how you're living your life? Who cares? Go make money. Who cares about people that don't even speak your language? They can't even say thank you to you in English. Stop giving your life away. For refugees or immigrants, stop caring whether kids who live on the other side of the tracks go to college or not. Just live your life, eat, drink, and be merry. Who cares, you know? Well, there was this constant, constant struggle happening inside of me, you know, because if all we have is, all we have is ancient myths, bleeding hearts, and what hope is there? for any change ever. It's a really dark time. But God wasn't done with me. And uh, a couple of ladies who, were, who went to one of the churches that I worked in came to me and said they wanted to send me to the Holy Land. And I'm not going to bore you with the Holy Land again, don't worry. I say that all the time. <laughs> I recognize. I was writing the sermon and my daughter saw me writing it and she said, they're going to get really tired of you talking about that. So I'm not going to talk about that. All you need to know is that I came back from that trip almost completely different, almost completely changed. And I say almost because I was so full of love and light all of a sudden, y'all. I was so full of hope because suddenly there was some truth I could trust. There was some objective reality. And for me, Jesus was it. Jesus was God in the flesh more than just a man. And I, I trusted that now. Beyond a shadow of any doubt, I trusted that. And that gave me a foundation to stand on, to aspire toward all the stuff that I've been working for before. But as full of light and love that I was, every time I thought back to Dr. Otto, I became enraged. How could he do that to students like me? How could he sleep at night and keep a straight face, feeding half-truths and lazy uh, academic work to students as though it's just the way it is, how could he? The thought of him and that agenda that he had, it just kind of made me sick to my stomach. And so it was like God had set me free from the prison that I was in, but I still had one foot in it, you know? There was still one thing just holding me back and I couldn't quite pull it out because I was like, I'm free, I'm alive, there's light within me except for this guy. <laughs> and I just couldn't quite completely break free. And I, I, I've got a hunch that you know the feeling I'm describing. Like you're living life and suddenly you've, you've got some momentum. Like you, you've had this eye-opening moment here at church or somewhere and you realize there's something more to live for. But there's that one thing, that one person 
or that one time they hurt you or that one thing they did or those people did. That's just keeping one foot back in that prison you used to live in. What happens to us then when we live in that place? What happens to us invariably? What happens is that we begin, unless we deal with this, we begin to project all the bitterness and resentment we feel toward that one person or that one group of people onto everyone else in our lives today who even remotely reminds us of them. So that's what I did. I went through this little season of a few years where I didn't trust any liberal academics at all. Like they were all evil. They all had an agenda. I became like a conspiracy theorist. Like nothing you learn in college is true. It's the Illuminati now. You know, like that kind of thing. (laughs) It was its own kind of crazy because I was projecting my experiences, my damage done with one person onto many others. And that's what we do. I've seen it all the time. I've seen Uh, You know, for example, like a woman who was hurt, really bad hurt, you know, by one man, one bad man. And she will, at a moment's notice, when she picks up red flags from any other men, she will project what she feels about this one man onto all kinds of other men because she hasn't dealt with this. And the same thing is is true for any of us. I got got, an email from a guy that calls this community home, and it broke his heart to write this to me. He did not want to confess this to me, but he said a few years back he was assaulted and robbed by some young African-American boys, and he said, it breaks my heart to tell you this, but every time I'm around a group of young African-American boys, I feel resentful, I I feel suspicious. He hasn't dealt with this, and so he's punishing everybody else. Reverend Rudy Rasmus, who's joining me tonight for the 5 p.m. conversation, he's, he's going to come and have a little Q&A with me at 5 p.m. here about forgiving enemies. He's talked about projecting his feelings about some white people in his life who have judged him and who have been unfair to him and, and, and held him down. He projects sometimes all of those feelings on to larger groups of people, white people. If you don't deal with this... It becomes this. This is the fastest way we have to living hell of our own making. This is no way to live our lives. So I went to that old college campus and sat down with Dr. Otto. For the first time in 17 years, I hadn't seen him since I graduated. And the whole way there, I was anxious. I expected the conversation to be contentious. I wanted it to be contentious. I was ready. Fired up the whole way there. When I arrived, something clicked. Something happened. He welcomed me into his office, sat down and talked to me for an hour and a half. I asked him for 20 minutes. He gave me an hour and a half. And I realized that a lot has changed in 17 years. Not everything, but a lot has changed. Dr. Otto has Parkinson's disease now. And I didn't know the extent to which it had uh, developed. And he's got scars on his head from brain surgeries. And the man who used to lecture a mile a minute can barely articulate a full sentence without slurring his speech. It was sad and hard to listen to. I also remembered why I ever liked him in the first place. He's a funny and charming guy underneath that veil of uh, crass jokes and evil bitterness. He's a charming guy. <laughs> There's something good in there that I'd forgotten about. I realized then that I'd created, in those five years, I had created in my mind a mythical monster called Dr. Otto that was far more fierce and scary than the actual Dr. Otto. And as the interview progressed, and as he began to share with me details about his life that I was not aware of, like how he was abused earlier in life, and how he's been mistreated and judged and kicked out by churches because of who he is, People in powerful places have abused him. I began to feel something happen within me. I began to feel this foot start to take a step out toward freedom. And it was the weirdest thing because he was still basically the same bitter, condescending man that I knew before. He was basically the same. But I wasn't the same. Not much had changed in him, but something dramatic had changed in me. And I realized, even though I felt this hate toward him for years, I love him now. I couldn't help loving him now. Now, I love him, but I don't need to like him. 
I love him. I don't need to hang out with him or be his friend. We don't need to hug it out. We hugged it out for this picture, but that's just what you do with a picture. You hug it out in pictures, but that was the only time, really. I don't need to hug him. I don't need to be friends. I just need to forgive him. Forgiveness does not mean excusing what he did. Forgiveness does not mean excusing it because I still believe it was wrong and I still believe he should be stopped from doing that sort of thing. But because Christ has grown my character, because Christ has grown my faith, I can now separate my feelings and my opinions from the eternal truth of his love and his grace that is offered and extended freely to all of us by no doing of our own. He loves me and Dr. Otto the same. My conversation with Dr. Otto reminded me of something very important. And if you hear nothing else, please take this home with you. Please take this in your car at home with you and think on this this week. Please just, these four words is all you need today. Please remember that broken people break people. Broken people break people. The man is deeply broken. And so he's broken people out of his brokenness. And the same was true for me when I was broken. I broke people too out of my own brokenness. And when you're broken, you break people too. And whoever has broken you, they're broken too. And so as that person you're thinking of, that enemy or those enemies that you're thinking of and whatever they did to you, as you consider all of that, don't consider what they've done in some kind of vacuum. Don't consider their offenses against you as some kind of just purely objective choice. What they did to you did not happen in a vacuum. They came to you preemptively broken. And that is not to excuse anything that's been done to you, but it helps to have mercy when you think of all the ways they were broken by others long before they ever got around to breaking you. Listen, forgiving enemies is not about making friends. Forgiving, for, forgiving enemies is about being free. First and foremost, it's about you being free. It's not about being a doormat to abusive or broken people. It's about realizing we've all been broken before. It's not about excusing whatever they've done to you. It's about, it's about realizing that you don't overcome evil with evil. You overcome it with good. And I know there are some broken hearts in this room right now, people that are really struggling with this, and I'm sorry if I've stepped too far, and I don't want to presume where you're at. I don't want to presume, you know, that, that you have to forgive right now. Maybe it's just too fresh, and that's okay, but I just... Need you to know you're not alone in this. We've all got enemies to forgive. Here's the good news. It's not your job to save them. Theologically speaking, it's not even your job to forgive them. Jesus already did that. All you got to do is get on board with Jesus. All you've got to do is see them with Jesus' eyes. That does not mean they have or will ever receive or accept that forgiveness. All it means is that you don't have to keep this foot in this prison anymore. You're free to go. And you have been. And who knows, one day by the grace and miraculous power of God's love, one day they'll see that they were set free too. For today, all there is to know is Jesus and the freedom that he came to give you and me and Dr. Otto and whatever enemies you have on your hearts right now.